and uh, just for Carol. And you're recording, cool. And he's okay. recording. Cool. Okay. Anyone with a testimony? Uh, can I uh, just my sister Estelle that we've been praying for uh, for her dodgy knee that she couldn't walk. She contacted me on Saturday as it was her first day of walking on her leg all day long. No crutch, no pain, no anything. So she asked me to just thank thank everybody for all their prayers, please. Amen. Yes, thank you, Lord. Anyone else? I see Stephen is smiling. Yes, uh, I just <laughs> want to switch my mic on. <laughs> OK, can you hear me? Yes. OK, I just want to thank everybody for the prayers. Uh, my father uh, came out of hospital on Friday afternoon late. Um, he's back at home and he's as strong as an ox. So thank you for everybody's prayer. Praise the Lord. Yeah, God is Amen. good. Excellent. Amen. Yes. Amen. God, God is good. good. Man. All the yeah. time. Yeah. All, yeah. The All the time. God is good. Amen. Amen. Yes, the Lord said if, 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 if more than two people gather in my name and they pray over the same thing, that it will be done. Amen. Amen. So, yes, we serve a miracle working God, guys. So, any, anyone else? No one. Okay, cool. Let me start. Guys, last Sunday. Um, I just want to recap quickly on last Sunday what I was talking about. Uh, I have given you a few points of stress. So I have hope you have all had a, 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 a stressless week. So yes, uh, um, a few stress related factors in our lives. The first one was change and uh, we don't like changing in our lives. And then I was talking about hectic schedules, uh, too much work on our plates, uh, insufficient skills, the lack of technical, managerial or social or cultural skills, lack of outlet, get out of your house or environment and do something and make sure you are doing something outside, not inside your house. And then uh, too much emotion, too much emotionally involved in your workplace or at your work. Uh, inability to take breaks. Uh, you know, more the one that um, I need to finish this before I can take a break. I need to do this before I can go off on lunch or tea break. Take a break. Doesn't matter if it's five minutes or ten minutes. Sit back, relax, enjoy your salmis, enjoy your coke or whatever you are eating but enjoy it in silence and make sure you are not sitting in the same office that you are working take a break guys just go out and take your five to ten minutes break then chronic illness or disease any illness or disease is stressful anyone doesn't matter what if you've got a, a normal headache or you've got COVID or whatever the case may be it is stressful and then overcrowding uh, too much people in one place can cause stress. We also talk about an unhealthy diet. Yes, the stuff we're eating and then we don't feel nice the next day or the day after that and it add a little bit of, of weight to my body and I don't feel comfortable in that. So yes, that's your unhealthy diet. And did you know that the human body get used to chronic pulls we take every day for whatever chronic sickness or disease we have? After three months, the doctor said, yep, Bude, you may come back or you must go back to the doctor so he can give you something stronger because the, 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 the pulse is not working anymore. That's because your body get used to it. And... Uh, you know, people that's going on a diet. Yes, I've lost three or five kilos in three months. Wow, that's awesome. And now, no, I'm stuck. You know why? Because your body get used to the stuff you are eating and you are drinking. So we need to look after ourselves. 
And uh, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, eh, we, we, we need to look after ourselves. And you will see people with chronic medicine. The doctor told them, okay, listen, after three months, come back. And they add up to that, or the doctor is looking at your body. And yes, we need to give you a stronger pull, or whatever the case may be. But your body get used to that. So yes, we need to look after ourselves. This body of yours or that body you've got is the only thing you've got. And you need to look after it until the Lord came. Or until you die, you need to look after your body. So please, guys, remember stress. Stress relates to sickness and sickness relates to death. So please look after your body. So yes, today I want to talk about prevention is better than cure. And we all know that little saying, striking the balance. Man, the number one principle is taking care of ourselves. In order to deal with the factor that threatened to, to drain us and ultimately render us helpless, we need to work at, take, at taking care of ourselves. Loving our neighbors as we love ourselves. Yes, that is one of God's commandments. Hey, love your neighbors like you love yourself. We cannot hope to do an adequate job of counseling or pastoring others if we have not taken proper care of our own needs as a priority. Loving yourselves play a vital part in controlling stress. Leviticus 19.18, he says, but you should love your neighbor as yourself. We should be meeting our own basic needs, having a proper diet, adequate clothing and shelter, development of your mind, your spiritual life and relationship with God, developing and uh, nurturing relationships with a group of friends who care about you and each other. And that is why we are on this group, guys, because we care about others. We care about our relationship with 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 uh, each other, and if we are in need, we pray for each other. So yes, that is a very good thing, uh, developing and nurturing relationship with a group of friends who care about you and each other, pursuing activities that gives you a sense of accomplishment, discovering and developing your God-given talent. Now, guys, this is a big thing. I can stop there and I can talk about this until kingdom come because God has given you something and you need to develop that something. I don't know what it is, but you need to develop that something, that uh, God-given talent. Now, you know, the in South Africa, I don't know, overseas, but you get a lot of guys, a lot of people, uh, gospel singers, and, uh, you know, you ask them, uh, listen, can't you guys come and sing for us uh, a few songs tonight? Oh, no, brother, you need to pay us because that is my my my, my calling in life. No, you need to pay me, then I will come and... Really? Serious? What happened to talents? It's a talent God gave you. Eh? It's not your job. It's something God gave you. And again, why must I pay you to come and sing for me? Huh? The word said, Freely I give it to you, and freely, freely you must give it away. So, yes, uh, you know, these days it's a money-making thing. Uh, Friday night we have had a gospel show, now the first time in two years. Uh, we gather here by uh, a church in PE uh, uh, Friday night, and wow, for the first time in two years, uh, it was awesome. And uh, not one of the guys that was singing there asked anybody, for money, not one of us. So yes, that is a talent, and we need to discover and we need to develop our God-given talent. Now, for me, singing is only a hobby. So it's not my talent; it's a hobby. I love it. I love it with a passion. So yes, we need to develop and discover our God-given talents. Only by meeting these needs in our lives can we progress to loving others and meet the same need in their lives. How can, we, how can we cope with stress? Well, the first thing is take a break. That's it, take a break. If at all possible, one should take a break of a few minutes 
every hour. Now I'm I'm I'm, I'm busy at uh, Coca Cola. Yeah, in uh, PE perseverance with uh, forklift training, and then I told this guy every hour. I told him, guys, take a break. Even if it's just 15 minutes or 10 minutes, just take a break. So I need to space myself. I said, okay, listen, I've got so much things on my mind to say. And the mind only can take up like 20 or half an hour. It can take in. Then afterwards, it's like, yo, your head is going this way and your mind is going that way and you think of other things. And yes, so that's why every 20 or every hour, I am taking a 10 to 15 minutes break. So yes, take a break. If at all possible, once you take a break of a few minutes every hour, no matter how busy you are, no matter how busy you are, this will reduce the stress level immediately. Would you try and introduce gradual changes into our lives? This prevent a buildup of stress. Try not to do what you normally do. We get used to do things, and Jesus call it tradition. Hey, now listen to this. Mark 7 and 13, it says, making the word of God of no effect through your tradition, which we have handed down, and many such things you do. We do what we learn from our fathers and mothers, and they learn from their fathers and their mothers, and we think that what we do is right. For instance, simple one, Christmas. Hey, that time of the year, 25th of December. Listen to this one. Uh, Jeremiah 10, verse 2 to 5, it says, Do not learn the ways of the Gentiles. Do not be dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the Gentiles are dismayed at them. Verse 3 says, for the customs, the habit, the tradition of the people are futile. For one cut a tree from the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with an axe. Verse 4, they decorate it with silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and hammers so that it will not stopple, uh, sorry, topple. Verse 5, they are upright like a palm tree and they cannot speak. They must be carried. So yes, guys, I can go on and on and on with this, but I think we all know what is it all about. So yes, do not do what your forefathers has done. Paul also says, do not do what they are doing. Why are we doing this to ourselves? And we learn and teach it to our children. So yes, how stupid can one get in this life? Because all of my life, I went to church and I went to a certain church with my parents and all of my life, I thought it was right. But until I, I, I went to a Pentecostal church and I was like, wow, goodness gracious, everything changes. Everything I believe, everything I've done was wrong in my life. But I learn it from my parents. So what I learn, I teach my kids. But luckily, luckily my, my kids were still in a younger age when I give my heart to the Lord, 91. So yes, I try to teach them the ways of the Lord. But yes, unfortunately they are big now and everything, everyone is doing what they need to do. So the word said in Isaiah 4 verse 6, he said, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I also will reject you from your to for, for being a priest for me. So yes, guys, remember, I am still busy with relaunching our potential. We do not know the word of God. And because we do not know the word of God, we will destroy ourselves by not knowing what God is or was calling us to do. So what am I saying? Exodus 34. 21, he said, six days you shall work, but on the seventh day you shall rest. In plowing time and in harvest you shall rest. So yes, God has put in a seventh day for each and every one of us to rest. Relax, sit back, relax, enjoy your family, enjoy your, 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 your kids, enjoy your wife on that day. Because God has put it in since 
whenever. We must rest. We need to take a break and make sure, guys, you take a break. We must avoid assuming burdens that are or should be responsibility of others. Eh? Remember, you've got your own problems. Now you get a lot of people, especially in the ministry. Uh, people need some counseling and now you sit and these people are talking to you. And And these people is talking to you and they put all their burdens on you. Now you need to listen to these guys. So what happened now? Are you guys still with me? Amen. Yes, amen. Thank you very much. So yes, so you need to listen to these guys. And now they're putting all the burdens on you. And now you are like, oh my goodness. And everybody is stressed up and everybody is like, this one is in that one's head. And oh my word. Now these people are leaving your house. Now you sit. You sit with all these burdens. And uh, <laughs> you listen to these people. So other people's problems, guys, don't make it your own. Now, I've learned through the years, if people is coming for counseling or they just want to come and talk to me and everything I put down on paper, I talk to them and said, okay, listen, guys, next week we come back and go and work on this or work on this and work on this. And as soon as those guys uh, uh, leave, I take that little piece of paper and I throw it in the dustbin. I don't want to know anything about them. I don't want to know nothing about them anymore. And... God is so good. Hey, sometimes my wife asks me, uh, uh, listen, what, what, what do those people talk about? I said, well, I don't know. No, come on, you just sit with him. I, said, I don't know. You know, it's like, no, it's gone with the wind. I don't want to remember them. I don't want to remember their, their problems because I have enough, enough of my own. If somebody talk to you, listen, uh, my friend, I've got this problem, pray for me. Do it right there. Do it right there because if you turn around and you go home, you will forget about that guy that was asking you this morning to pray for him. Get it over with. Get it out of your system. Pray for him and get it out of your system. And that's it. We must learn to accept ourselves and our imperfections. Learn to forgive ourselves when we make mistakes. We must learn that seeking counsel is an avenue of personal development. Proverbs 12, 15 says, the way of a fool is wise in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. Yes, sometimes, somewhere in your life, you need to talk to someone about something. So, yes, as the old saying goes, prevention is better than cure. We should therefore rather become aware of the possible areas that could be dangerous to us and to take pre uh, preventative measures beforehand. For instance, if you know or you know your body, hopefully, you know what's going on in your body, and then all of a sudden you get a headache. Eh? You don't leave that headache, let it put over and, and develop. And no, you take a headache pull. So yes, prevention is better than cure. So to prevent that headache to spread, and make you sick and make you miserable, you take a discipline or a panada or whatever the case may be. So, yes, prevention is better than cure. We should therefore rather become aware of the possible areas that could be dangerous to us and to take preventative measures beforehand. If we live according to this balance, life, except the change of being burned out, are minimal. We must live a balanced life. When examining the four dimensions of our lives, the spiritual, the physical, mental or soulish, and the social, we need to bring each of these into harmony with the other. We need to complete the following evaluation in each of the four areas and begin to develop the areas where we lack. So yes, guys, I'm coming in for landing. Say hallelujah or amen. Hallelujah and amen. Yes, thank you. <laughs> so yes, what I see, what I hear, 
contribute to a healthy mind? Are my attitude ones that inspire others? Am I trying to root out impure motives? Am I doing all I can do in my studies or personal enrichment? Do I demonstrate self-control in my eating habits and decision making? Do I exercise enough? Do I spend time talking to God and depending on, on him during the day? Am I sharing my faith with my Christian friends? Am I using my abilities and gifts to serve others? The most important external source of help is God himself. That's why I said, guys, not last Sunday, there's somebody before. If you feel stressed out, the word of God said, ask and you shall be given. So if we ask the Lord to give us that, that little bit of strength just to overcome this problem, then God is there with you. He is the only external source of help we can get. God himself. So yes, I'm knocking off with this verse, Matthew 11, 28. It says, come to me, eh? come to me, not to dare, come to me, God, all you who labor and are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. And that rest, guys, you won't believe it. Uh, I don't know if some of you have um, tried this, but all of a sudden, uh, Lord, I need this. I need this rest in my life. Then all of a sudden, it's like, wow, what happened to me? You know, it's relief. It feels like a, a big burden is like off your shoulders all of a sudden. And you feel good. And it's like, wow, thank you, Lord. So, yes, guys, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. And give, I will give you rest. Thank you, guys. Over to Pastor Paul. Thank you, Pastor Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Dirk. That was very good. One thing I have to just, just add a little thing there is, well, I agree with everything you say. Um, that sometimes stress it can be is, is an ugly thing. We all go through it. We go through it sometimes. We're going through stress. We don't realize we're going through stress as well. But for me, if I'm feeling stressed and I've got pressure and all this stuff, which you talked about a week or two ago as well, the best way for me to get rid of it is to focus on somebody else who needs help. And put your focus on other people. Put others first before yourself. Because the stress increases because we focus on ourselves. All right? We'll focus and we'll dwell on the problem or what the or the cause of the stress and oh how can I do this and and you thinking about self and how you can get through it all and I I I I I and that increases the stress even more. Where if we focus just Lord I have this problem and I know you're going to help me through and carry on keep your focus on the others keep your focus on the Great Commission on serving God. Living out, living out a Christian life, and then it sorts itself out, and it's amazing how it. I, I know Pastor Dirk will agree with me on that. I know he's, you know, I'm sure you've been through it, Pastor Dirk. I know I do it all the time, and it's it, it's quite amazing. It's amazing yes. how it happens. Yes, it is. And uh, Pastor Paul, before you carry on, um, just struck something. Just struck me now. Um, if we look at uh, Jesus, his walk on earth. Yeah, the only time in the Bible I saw he was praying for himself was in the Ketamine. Uh, um, yes. Where was said, Father, if it's your will, let this, this cup pass me. That was the only time he prayed for himself. If we as Christians uh, um, get the focus of ourselves and we try and we start praying for other people, then you will see everything will just fall in place. You don't need to ask God for nothing. Everything will fall in place. Sorry, yeah, Pastor Paul. I'm going to carry on with your example. He prayed for himself <laughs> in the garden, okay? Because he knew what was coming. All right? The soldiers came. What did Peter do? He went and cut off that one guy's ear. What did Jesus then go and do? He wasn't all, oh, no, I'm going to get crucified. and Oh, what am I going to do? 
What did he go do? He focused on somebody else and he healed them. <clears throat> and he and, and so forth. So anyway, Amen. we're going to go into communion. Guys, it's something a little bit different, okay, but interesting. Well, I found it very interesting. I've edited it as much as possible. It's still about 10 minutes long, so bear with me. I found it very interesting and so forth, and hopefully some of us can learn and see some things from here, all right? So <clears throat> about crucifixion, all right? So it's going to be talking quite a bit about crucifixion here. Now, historians, they trace back that the first known practice of crucifixion was committed by the Persians, okay? Although it, it was not like the crucifixion that we know of, all right, yet it was just as brutal, and they developed it as much and as and, and so on and so forth. Now, back then, it was more like impaling a person on a sharpened pole, and they would be hung on that until they died. Now, the Persians, they became very skilled knowing how to impale a person. They developed it and they mastered the skill of impaling the person, but keeping them alive for days on end, prolonging their death with maximum suffering. Okay? Now, we actually have an example of this in the book of Esther, chapter 514, where Haman built some gallows upon which he wanted to hang Mordecai. Okay? Now, it was not the hangman's noose or, you know, being hung like we, most of us may have thought, okay? Because actually the word translated as gallows actually means a tree, a pole, or wood, all right? And many commentaries going through my research and all that also insist it, it also means impaling, all right? Now, a few hundred years later, the Greeks adapted the crucifixion as a means of punishment during the reign of Alexander the Great after they conquered the Persians. So they obviously got it from the Persians. And then the Romans continued with crucifixion after the Greeks. And they rapidly developed a very, very high degree of efficiency and skill in carrying it out. Now, like I said, I've, I've edited a lot because there's so much to this. But this type of torture, as we know, was normally reserved for traitors, criminals, and murderers. Also, when a person was crucified, unlike pictures that we see and, and films that we see, they were completely naked. All right? Or so it was with most of the Roman crucifixions anyway. <clears throat> As this added to their humiliation. And also, in some cases, with the males, they'd also do something with their genitals too. All right? But well, I'm not going to go on that one today. A prophecy in Psalm 2218 pertaining to Christ's crucifixion says, they divide my garments among them and my clothing they cast lots. So he was naked. Even to this day, crucifixion is still considered to be the most painful thing a human being can go through by all medical scientists. All right? The word excruciating as in excruciating pain, is actually derived from the word crucifixion. And some say that this is where also suicide watches were instituted. As those who were condemned to the cross would rather kill themselves in prison, if possible, than to go and endure what was to come. So they would po post guards down in the dungeons with them. It was the most feared thing back in those days. And if we had to go back in time, pull one of those citizens back to our time and put them inside a Catholic church, they would run out of there screaming with fear. It would be, it would be like for them as it would be for us going inside a satanic church. They would be so fearful and confused to see people bowing down to a man on a cross, essentially bowing down and worshipping the most gruesome and feared punishment known to man. 
And now because medical science has developed so much over the years, we now have more insight and understanding of what actually happens to an individual that's on the cross. Besides nails in the feet and the wrists. All right. Now, it's a very safe assumption to say that Jesus knew all the ins and outs of crucifixion. How it was implemented and all the pain and suffering that was endured. It is safe to say because he grew up under Roman control and it was clearly implemented before because also the high priest said crucify him too. All right. But there's something we all need to know about crucifixion before we continue. We've all seen movies, pictures and everything or movies where Christ or someone else has been crucified. You see them hanging there on the on, on the cross and they pretty much are they're hanging there until they die. Okay? That is not the case whatsoever. The person who's crucified is very active on the cross and actually never stops moving until they die. All right, I'll explain why a bit a bit further along. Now, uh, skipping past his whippings and beatings, but bury that be, bearing that in mind, okay, and going straight to his crucifixion. Mark 15, 23 says this. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. Okay. Now that was generally used as a, a mild anesthesia, all right, to help numb the pain. All right. But as we see, Jesus refused it. And this was just before he was crucified. Then we see the legionnaire feels for the depression at the front of the wrists. So the nail didn't go through there, through here. All right. And he drives a heavy, square, wrought iron nail through the wrists and deep into the wood. But making sure he doesn't pull on the arms too tightly. That the arms were a bit slack. There was a reason for it. Their left foot was then pressed backward and against the right foot, and with both feet extended down with toes down, that would call that would cause the knees to bend, okay, into an arch. And a nail was driven through the arch of each. Now, with his knees being flexed at about 45 degrees. This would have forced him to bear his weight with the muscles of his thighs, which is not a position easy to maintain for more than a few minutes without severe cramp in the muscles or the thigh or the calf muscles. If you go and get into a sitting position but not sitting on a chair, you go and see how long you can last like that for. Not long. <laughs> a couple of minutes, some of us, okay? Especially me. Now, as the strength of the muscles of Jesus' lowest limbs tired, the weight of his body had to be transferred to his wrists because now his feet are tired. So, obviously, now he's extending himself. <clears throat> it went to his wrists, it went to his arms and his shoulders. It is said that within a few minutes of being placed on the cross, Jesus' shoulders would have been dislocated and minutes later, his elbows and wrists would have also been dislocated. All right. The results of these dislocations would have meant that his arms would have been approximately nine inches longer than normal. It's about that long, guys. Ish. Psalm 22 14 confirms this. I'm poured out like water and all. My bones are out of joint. After Jesus' wrists, elbows, and shoulders were dislocated, the weight of his body on his upper limbs caused traction forces on his muscles of his chest wall. Okay? These, tra these traction forces cause his rib cage to be pulled upwards and outwards in a most unnatural state. His chest wall was permanently in position of what is called medically um, maximal 
respir respiratory inspiration. In other words, in order to exhale, Jesus was required to force his body to exhale. In order to breathe out, Jesus had to push down on the nails on his feet to raise his body and allow his rib cage to move downwards and inwards to exhale hair from his lungs. So, unlike the movies, the victim was extremely active. They were forced to move up and down the cross, a distance about 12 inches, about so much, in order to breathe. So within minutes of being crucified, Jesus was already fighting with suffocation of sh or shortness of breath. We know clearly now the reason why they broke the legs of the victims, as this would have caused them to suffocate within minutes, as they would be unable to lift themselves up to exhale. That's why they broke their legs. And now because Jesus could not breathe properly, he would have gone into a state of what they call hyperventilation, which is not enough air ventilation, which in turn would have caused his blood oxygen levels to fall, which is also known as hypoxia. And in addition to that, and because of that, his blood carbon dioxide, the CO2, levels would have risen, which have stimulated his heart to beat faster in order to increase the delivery of oxygen to remove the CO2. But due to the nailing of Jesus to the cross, his prior blood loss from whipping and his ever-increasing exhaustion, he was unable to provide more oxygen. The twin forces of too little oxygen and too much CO2 caused his heart to beat faster and faster. And his pulse rate, they say, was probably about 220 beats a minute. The maximum normal sustainable. Medically, it's said that because of these symptoms that he was going through, it was more likely, more than likely, that plasma and blood gathered, gathered in the space around his heart. This fluid around the heart would have prevented his heart from beating properly. And it's said that it is more, most likely that he eventually did die from cardiac rapture. In other words, his heart literally burst, literally burst. This is probably the water and blood that came out of Jesus, which scripture speaks of when the legionnaire pierced his side. What I went through now, like I said, is a very edited version. But my point I'm trying to make is, our Lord did, our Lord did all of that willingly. And you know what? Through all of that whipping, through all of that on that cross, through all that going up and down for three hours. Can you imagine the excruciating pain? And you know what? He could still, he still led somebody to heaven. He still gave words of comfort. But how? We have a headache and we can't go to church. He could have got out of it at any time, yet he chose to show the depths and extremes of his love and how far he was willing to go for each and every single one of us. How far are we willing to go for him? Let us never take what he did for granted. Let us not take it lightly or fall into a dull habit of just taking or partaking of communion. I could have got a lot more graphic with what I was talking to you, what I've given you today, a lot more, because there was so much in there. It was a bit extreme, and I know there are sometimes children listening in, in so I didn't go there, but it's bad. It was really worse and a lot worse than what I've given you today. Let us remember there has never been or never will be a person who will go through all that willingly for us, even when we do not even know him. 
Not only has there ever been a person who will ever go through that for us, but there's never been a God who has ever gone through that for us. To me, and just that alone tells me that he is truly worthy. He's truly worthy to be called the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's truly worthy to take my life into his hands and do as he wishes with it. There's been no other and there will never be no other like him. Thank you, my Lord Jesus, for your eternal display of love for all of us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that without your suffering, without your pain, without the spilling of your blood, we are all truly worthless, worthless and deserving of hell. We honor you, my Lord, with our gathering here today in remembrance of you. But not only to remember to you, to remember you, but loving you with all our hearts and all our souls. And Lord, we will not forget that sacrifice and what you went through for us. That final act of love, our pouring love that you did for us. We praise you for it, my Lord. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the blood of our Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, guys. Yes, amen. Thank you, Pastor Paul. I think I must hire you to come and do some of my uh, first aid courses. <laughs> very nice. Serious, very nice. Yes. Um, I have also have done some studies about that thing, and yes, it can get harsh. Um, like you said, there's some children looking or listening to this, and yeah, it can be very brutal. But uh, remember this, guys, he has done all of that for for us, for every one of us. And we can be thankful for that. And yes, praise the Lord that he has done it for every one of us. Thank you, guys. Um, I'm going to ask Stephen to knock off in prayer for us, please. And everybody, may you have a stressless week and weekend. Okay, don't stress too much. And if you stress, just give me a call. I will tell you what to do. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Savior, who died on the cross for us. But thank you, Lord, that he was also resurrected. And he's now living, living, sitting next to you, Father, where he's also standing in for us. Father, I'm asking that you bless us during this week, that you heal all the sick. Thank you, Father, for everything that you do for us. Thank you that that you've given Jesus for us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, Father. Father, I'm asking that this word that came out today, that it will grow, that it will bear much fruit. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, it was somebody saying.